Hello and welcome to Divi Coaching. Today we're going to be building this three column blurb row and the exciting thing about it is that you're not restricted by the blurb module so I'm not using a blurb module at all. I'm simply using a column background with a background color and then I've used an image and two text modules and a button to create the blurb. Now the other really exciting thing about this is that I've used responsive typography throughout. So you'll see here that we're looking at a large desktop layout, but if I start to gradually scale this, and I'm using the inspector here on Chrome, you'll see that the fonts all scale, the spacing scales, the buttons move, the padding on the buttons move, everything basically scales all the way down right to the breakpoint where it changes over to tablet. And once we go to tablet, you'll see again that the font is sized appropriately, and we can then keep reducing even further and the fonts get smaller and smaller, everything reduces in proportion all the way down to the minimum width uh, which we've designed for, which is 320, which is the narrowest smartphone that you're likely to see. So you can see that everything stays in proportion and looks really good all the way down from the smallest phone up to the largest desktop. So without any further ado, let's crack on with getting this built. I'm going to build this blurb row on a page rather than building it in the library. Uh, I just find it easier to build it on a page and we can then export it to a library at a later date. So in order to do that from the WordPress dashboard, I'm going to go to pages and I'm going to click on add new. I'm going to paste in the title of my page, which is three column blurb row, and I'm going to click to use the Divi Builder. Once we're in the builder, I'm going to choose build from scratch and click on start building. And I'm going to add a three column row to the section. Now I'm choosing three columns. Um, you could choose two, you could choose four. Uh, in, in the end, you'll probably end up making one for each of the different number of columns that you want to use. The reason you want to make a different row is that the settings that we're going to use to dynamically scale the font will depend on the number of columns in the row. So as I say, I'm going to choose a three column option. You might want to choose two or four. So once we've added that, I'm not going to add any modules for the moment. Uh, in order that we can see what we're doing, I'm going to go into the section settings, background, and I'm going to set a light gray background for the section so that the columns stand out. So the way that we're going to be working is we're going to be using the column effectively as a container for our blurb module. So we're not going to actually be putting a module into the column. Well, we are. We're going to be putting content modules into the column, but it's the column itself that will work as the blurb rather than a module that we're going to put into it. So in order to do that, I'm going to go into the settings for the row. I'm going to go into design. I'm going to go into sizing and I'm going to increase the maximum width of the row to 80%. Now it depends, you may have a different number in there depending on how you have your default page set up, but I like to use 80% for the width and 80% for the max width, and that makes sure that I have a nice responsive layout for my row. While we're here, I'm also going to enable the equalize column heights, and this will ensure that when we do start putting content into the columns, the background of the column will always be a consistent height across the three rows. Once I've done that, I'm going to save. I'm going to go into the row settings again, and I'm going to choose the first column. And in that column, under background, I'm going to set a white background. From the design tab, I'm then going to choose box shadow, and I'm going to set a box shadow on that column to again, just lift it a little bit more off the page. And I'm clicked to save. The first module that we're going to add is an image. So I'm going to click on here, and I'm going to choose an image module. Now, when you're sizing images, uh, it really depends on the largest usage of the image on the site. So in Divi, when these three columns stack, say in a tablet mode, what you'll end up with is quite a large image. So we need to make sure that the images that we load are large enough to look good at that resolution. Uh, I've done a bit of maths and I reckon a 600 wide image will be perfect. So um, we're going with a cake theme today. I've got a chocolate cake here and you'll see it is 600 by 400. So I'm going to choose that image and I'm going to upload it. Now we've got a little bit of a problem. My calculation wasn't perfect and we've got a bit of a white margin at the edge here. Uh, very easy to fix that though. We can go into sizing 
and we can click on force full width and that basically will sort out the issue and make the image fit the column and we can then click on save. I'm now going to go back to the desktop view and we can start adding the other modules that we'll need to make up our blurb. First thing we're going to need is a headline and in order to do that I'm going to add a text module. As we've got a chocolate cake here I am going to call this chocolate cake not surprisingly and we want this to be a heading so I'm going to choose an H4. Next we want a description so I'm going to add another module that will also be a text module and I'm just going to leave the default copy in here for now so you get the idea but this will be the description of our cake. And finally we're going to add a button which will allow someone to well in this case order a cake. So I'm actually going to change the button text here to order now. Now that we've got all our elements in place we can start some styling. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is go into this heading and into design, heading text. Now remember this is an H4 so I'm going to click on H4 and I'm going to give it a light brown colour because I think that goes with the chocolatey theme. While I'm here I'm also going to go into the spacing and I'm going to remove all of the default spacing from the top and bottom. So that's all of the margin and all of the padding I'm going to set to zero because we're going to deal with all of the spacing with our custom CSS. While we're at it I also want to lose this space underneath the image. By default an image uh, will have space underneath it and that is found in the spacing setting underneath the design tab of image and you'll see show space below the image and again I want to disable that so that will remove that space and as I say all of the spacing is going to be dealt with in the custom CSS. I'm now going to go into the paragraph text, into design, into spacing and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take out the margin and take out the default padding. Finally we're going to go into the button, we're going to go to design, button, we're going to use custom styles for button and I'm going to go in and set a text colour of white, set a background colour of brown, I'm going to remove the border width so there's no border. I don't particularly like the uh, icon that appears on hover so I'm going to come down and I'm going to remove the show button icon but we do need something to happen on hover so I'm going to set a hover colour. So under button background I'm going to choose the mouse setting, hover setting and I'm going to choose the light brown colour again. So now we've got the normal will be dark brown and on hover it will go to the light brown colour. I also want to sort the font out. So I'm going to come down to button font. Now I'm using Montserrat as my headline font but buttons by default take the uh, text font rather than the headline font. I'd like it to be the headline font so I'm going to come in here and I'm going to choose Montserrat for my button. I'd also like the style to be slightly bolder so I'm going to go with a semi bold, uppercase letters and a little bit of whoops and a little bit of line spacing so I'm going to add two pixels of line spacing in here as well. So I'm happy with that. While I'm here I'm also going to go down to spacing and I'm going to set the padding and this is what affects the distance between the side of the button and I'm going to go with 0.5m for my top and bottom spacing and I'm going to go with 1m for my left and right spacing. Okay happy with that and by choosing m's here it means that when we change the size of the font in our CSS the spacing in the button will change automatically. Okay so we made all the changes that we need to make now to the styling. One more thing I want to do if you've uh, seen my previous tutorials about display flex and about aligning items in a column uh, you'll see that if you have variable amounts of text in here in order to get the uh, buttons to line up at the bottom of the column we need to use Flexbox. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, all we need to change is we need to come into the row settings, 
coming to the first column settings, really important that we're in the column settings. We need to choose advanced custom CSS. We just need to add two lines of CSS into the main element. And those lines are display flex and flex direction column. So this is basically setting our column to be a flex container, which allows us to space the items vertically in that column using our CSS a little bit later on. There is one final uh, setting that's related to what we've just done with Flexbox, which is in order to get the button to sit nicely at the bottom of the column, we need to go into the button spacing and we need to set the top margin to be auto. That's really important because if we set the top margin to be auto, it will um, work with the settings, with the CSS that we're going to add later on, and it will ensure that all the buttons neatly line up at the bottom of the column. OK, having done that, we can now create our other columns. So I'm going to come into the row settings. I actually just simply delete the other two columns and then I duplicate the first column. I find that's a really easy way of just you know, creating three columns. I can now uh, nip in and we need to change the image. So I'm going to go into image and choose a different cake. And the same with the third column into the image and again, Choose a different cake. And we can now set up the titles. So this looks like a fondant cake to me. So we'll call it a fondant cake. And this one looks like a raspberry cake. So we'll come in here and we'll call this one, whoops, a raspberry cake. OK, so now we've done all the work that we need to do in the Divi Builder. The rest of the work that we need to do, we're going to use the um, customizer to enter some custom CSS. Now, there's one more thing we need to do before we can start adding the CSS. Uh, in order to make the targeting more effective, I'm going to go into the row and I'm going to give the entire row a custom class. So to do that, we go into the Advanced tab. We click on CSS ID and Classes and we give it a class name. In this case, DC blurb row three. Now, really important, we don't start that with a period or a full stop. Um, that's what we use to refer to the class in CSS. But when you're actually giving a name of a class to a row, you simply use the name without the period. So we've now assigned a class to our row. And that means that when we start to target items like the button, for example, we can target every button that appears in the row with a style, um, and it will mean that it, the, the CSS that we write won't affect other areas of our site um, that don't have that class applied to them. OK, so having done that, we can save one last time and we can exit the Visual Builder. Now that we're out of the Visual Builder, we can go to the Theme Customizer. Now, you could add the CSS um, in the Divi options. You could add it to a child theme. Uh, or you can add it to the customizer. I'm using the customizer today because it's easier for me to add it and for people to follow along and see what I'm doing. So if we go to additional CSS, we don't need this guide. And then the first bit of CSS we're going to paste in is going to deal with the spacing. Please see the description below for details of all of the CSS that's used in this tutorial. So the first bit we're going to paste in is going to deal with the spacing. And as soon as I paste that in, you will see that it spaces everything really nicely. Now, let's have a look at what it's actually doing. So remember, we added a class of DC blurb row three to our row. So what we're looking for here is any H4 that is inside an element with that class. So the row has that class and we're looking for any H4 elements that are anywhere nested inside that row. So these are the three H4 elements. We are setting a margin of 2m at the top and a padding left and right of 5%. So that's all spaced really nicely. The next thing we're looking at is the same selector, but we're selecting the P or the paragraph element. And we're just setting the same padding either side, left and right of that paragraph. And then there's a quirk of Divi that it styles the last of type paragraph in a module with no spacing underneath. So uh, we're actually adding a margin to make sure that we have a margin between the bottom of the, sorry, a minimum margin between the bottom of the paragraph and the button. 
And finally, the button itself, we're setting a margin left of 5%. Now it's a margin rather than a padding because with a button, when you set padding, it's inside the button, whereas the margin is the outside of the button. So we're spacing the button 5% away from the left hand side and we're also setting a margin bottom of 1M. Next, we need to set up the CSS, which is going to control the dynamic type sizing. So for that, we're gonna be using the clamp function. And luckily there's a really good tool that we can use to help us with that. So if you go to responsive font calculator, and again, I've put a link below, you will find this calculator, which helps to build the clamp function for us. Um, well worth build, reading through the explanation, explains exactly how it works and how it calculates the font size. So in order to use it, we need to make sure we've selected pixels at the top. Don't need to worry about these two next entries. The next really important thing is viewport. Now, because we're setting up our font sizes initially for the desktop, we're going to go from the minimum to the maximum size that we want the desktop settings. We're going to use a media query to set up the tablet and below sizes later on. So for now, we're just focusing on the desktop. So in order to do that, we want our desktop to go from 981. So 980 is the breakpoint to go down to tablet and we want it to go up to 1920. So what this is going to do for us is generate a clamp statement that is going to make our font scale continuously from widths of between 981 and 1920 of the viewport. Once we've set up the viewport width, we can then look at the range of the font sizes that we want to use. So for example, for our heading, so for this H4 heading, and, and you will need to use a little bit of trial and error here to get it looking exactly how you want it, but for that particular heading, I want the font size to be 14 pixels at the smallest size, so at the 980 size, and I want it to be 20 pixels at the largest size. So in order to uh, achieve that, I come in here and I change the range from 14 up to 20. So what this means is that a width of 981, the font size is gonna be 14, and at a viewport width of 1920, the font size is gonna be 20 and it will dynamically scale as we scale the viewport between those two different sizes. We can then come down here and we'll see that the clamp statement has been generated for us. We can simply highlight and copy that clamp statement and we can paste it. So we're looking at the H4 at the moment. So we go to H4 and we can simply paste in that clamp statement and that will make sure that our uh, font is set correctly for the H4 heading. We then repeat the exercise for the other two sizes. So we can go for the paragraph and finally for the button. So exactly the same exercise. Um, I've actually set the text in the button to be the same size as the H4. And then I've chosen a suitable setting for the paragraph text. So once we've pasted in all three of those clamp statements, we can publish, we can refresh the page and we can see where we are. So if we now come into the developer tools and we go with the responsive sizing here, we'll find that as we scale the page from the maximum width, as we gradually reduce, everything is reducing in proportion. So our spacing, because remember the spacing is driven by M's, so that's taking its sizing from the font. So as the font gets smaller and smaller, the spacing also uh, decreases and everything just basically reduces in proportion. So at one point, well in fact at the 980 width, we will notice that suddenly we flip to the tablet view. And in the tablet view actually the font's quite small. Now the reason it's small is because if we go back just a tiny little bit, this font is being calculated based on the overall width. And obviously once we come down to here, it's still using the viewport width to determine it, but this column is obviously a lot wider. Now we can fix that with a media query um, and that's the next thing that we're going to do. So if we come out of the inspector, we go back into the customizer. If we go back to our fluid responsive font size calculator, we can now change some settings. So we've already dealt with font sizes from 981 to 1920. 
we're going to we're now concerned with font sizes from the smallest width which is going to be 320 pixels for the smallest phone up to uh, 980 and we then need to go in again and put in the fonts that we want to use at those sizes so for example um, for the headline I know I want to use 14 to 20 again so it's the same setting and this will regenerate the CSS for me and we can go through the same exercise again of copying and pasting the CSS statements this time inside a media query so if we add that media query now and just to run through that we've got at media all and max width 980 so all devices up to a maximum width of 980 and then you can see the clamp functions which have been adjusted using the revised sizes from this calculator if we now publish we'll find that if we again go into the inspector developer tools and we'll now found we've got much better much more appropriate font size for the size of the column so now we have a fully responsive three column blurb display and as we reduce the size all the font scale all the spacing scales right the way down until it stacks for the uh, tablet view and at that point it also resizes the font to be appropriate for that view and if we continue reducing even further we'll find that things get even smaller and smaller and smaller all the way down to the minimum width that we've set of 320 so it will work even on the smallest phone so we have a layout and a design and appropriate font sizing that works for every different size. I hope you found this tutorial useful. You might want to check out the other tutorial I have on responsive header, uh, and there's a link to that coming up now. And also my other tutorials on um, Flexbox and how you can vertically distribute items in a column. Uh, so for example, for lining up buttons and things. Uh, just to show how that actually works, I'm going to go back into the Visual Builder for a moment and show you that if we, for example, add a extra paragraph of text in here. So let's copy this paragraph and add in another paragraph of text and save. Save the changes. For some reason, the um, builder doesn't visualize this properly at the bottom. So if we now come out of the builder, you'll see that we've added an extra paragraph of text. All of the columns have resized themselves and the buttons have aligned themselves at the bottom of the column. So thank you very much for watching this tutorial today. I hope you found it useful. If you have, please do like and subscribe. Thank you very much and I'll see you next time.